Thank you very much. Um, we have the pleasure today to hear from a very accomplished woman. And uh, I have to say that from working with the Conservation Authorities branch about 35 years ago at the Ministry of Natural Resources, there were not a lot of women that were in the field that Jennifer finds herself. And uh, it probably wasn't always easy. Um, so I'm very pleased to introduce Jennifer Stevens, who's the general manager of the Saugeen Valley Conservation Authority. She's worked at uh, many other conservation authorities and brings a wealth of experience to our area. And uh, I'm sure we'll be delighted to hear what she has to tell us about the changing role of conservation authorities and, and what we can expect them to do. Um, Jennifer. Thank you very much for that introduction and I'd like to thank the Provost Club and the Grey Highlands Library, Public Library, and of course the Kimberley Community Association for the invitation to speak to you today. It is so fabulous to see what a great turnout this is. So just to begin, uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, I started with South Nation Conservation Authority in Eastern Ontario, which is just one conservation authority east of the Quebec border. It's to the east of the city of Ottawa. And I began there in 2003. So for the last 20 years, I've worked with 10 conservation authorities, including working with Conservation Ontario, which is the umbrella organization of the conservation authorities, where I worked with all 36 of the conservation authorities at the infancy of the Drinking Water Source Protection Program. So I'll hopefully be able to speak to you about some of those experiences anecdotally as I walk through this talk. So to begin, um, I'd like to show you that today is a primer on conservation authorities. However, I am going to be biased to Saugeen Valley Conservation Authority because, of course, that's where I found my home now. Um, this particular picture was taken at one of our conservation authorities, uh, Schmidt Lake. Um, I invite you to, um, if you, any of these pictures are at all appealing to you, they have all been taken at our conservation authorities. So I invite you to come and visit <coughs> any of our conservation authorities. So the Conservation Authorities Act itself is, um, was passed in 1946. And it was passed largely because there was a, a number of, of uh, issues with, with erosion. But it was really in, as a result of Hurricane Hazel in 1956 uh, or 1954 when um, the conservation authorities became largely um, aware of their existence and became known for the, their need. Um, as part of that particular tragedy, there was the ability for conservation authorities to regulate what was being built in the floodplains. And later in time, it became more the conservation authorities became more responsible for what was being developed in shorelines and watercourses, as well as any kind of area close to watercourses and any kind of development that was going to change the alteration of a water course. Hurricane Hazel, of course, happened in 1954. And this particular quote was taken from one of the, um, one of the firemen who was on Raymore Drive. And Raymore Drive was in what is now the downtown city of Toronto. And I, I don't want to read the quote to you, but I, perhaps all of you can just read it and, and just imagine being there, the rush of Niagara Falls. This is a flood. And houses that are being uprooted and trees bobbing. Just, just a flood. And we think that floods don't happen right now. And I think, I'll ask you to keep that in the back of your mind. Floods don't really happen. <laughs> It's a local phenomenon. 
This was only a few years ago. Flooding. The Saugeen River near Walkerton. In Hurricane Hazel in 1954, 428 cubic centimeters. Here we are in 2018, 484 centimeters. Our water levels are continuing to rise, as are the water levels on the Great Lakes. We are continuing to see more water, water that is being released from various ice caps, they're being released from the snow caps, they're being released from the permafrost, water is being released and it's raising our water levels. So to be able to understand what a conservation authority is, you need to understand what a watershed is. Because this is what makes a conservation authority so special. A watershed is essentially a catchment. All the water that falls within that catchment is being captured and is going to be kept within that catchment. So if it falls from the sky, it's going to infiltrate into the ground. If it falls at the headwaters of the, of the watershed, it's going to be run off into, into the soil or it's going to run into the river that that catchment belongs to, for example, the Saugeen River. Right now we're in the headwaters of the Saugeen River. The end of the catchment or its catchment area is Lake Huron. But the watershed transcends municipal boundaries. And that's what's so special about a watershed. And that is why it's so special that conservation authorities exist, is we're looking beyond a municipality. We're looking at the environment at the scale at which it was meant to be looked at. Saugeen Valley Conservation Authority is one of 36 conservation authorities. So there are 31 in Southern Ontario and five in Northern Ontario. Now in Northern Ontario, the conservation authorities are actually located around urban centers. So Sudbury, Timmins, North Bay, Sault Ste. Marie, and Thunder Bay. They are not per se on a watershed basis, but certainly those in Southern Ontario are. And if we look at SBCA, we have, we're the fifth largest in the province, which is huge land area, 4,600 square kilometers. And we're rural. We have no major urban centers. We are just like, a communi like communities like this. And that's special because there's a lot of things that go into a rural conservation authority. We have 15 municipalities, five counties, 118 kilometers of shoreline along Lake Huron, and we have southwestern Ontario's largest forested wetland, which is the Greenock Swamp. Now when we look at, at the actual watershed itself, that's a big picture. And as much as we like to assess a watershed on its whole, <coughs> we do, do look at the watershed as a whole, but we also like to investigate the watershed on sub-watersheds, because that allows us to look at whether or not the, watershed, the actual watersheds are healthy and whether or not some watersheds need our attention elsewhere. So these are our sub-watersheds. We have the Bibi Saugeen um, right through to the upper main Saugeen River. Next, I'd like to talk to you about our water resources. Our water quality monitoring programs are extensive at Saugeen Valley Conservation Authority, as they are at most conservation authorities. Most conservation authorities participate in what's called the Provincial Water Quality Monitoring Network, which is a joint initiative between the province of Ontario and the a conservation authority. The province of Ontario pays for the analysis of the 
of the uh, water quality results, whereas the Conservation Authority actually goes out and collects the information in the field and sends that information through to the province. It's a, it's a wonderful partnership. Um, there is also a, a similar program called the Provincial Groundwater Monitoring Network, whereby after the Walkerton tragedy, that particular network was set up and that network looked at groundwater. Several wells were put in, in, in overburden areas, which is shallow, um, shallow uh, under, under the ground, where um, there is generally sand and silt, um, not far into the bedrock, where we have deeper aquifers, and we do have some wells in, in bedrock aquifers as well. And you'll notice that we, we do have surface water, groundwater, but we also have biomonitoring. That brings us to the Ontario Benthos Biomonitoring Network. Does anybody know what Benthos means? No, Benthos means benthic macroinvertebrates. Aha, I caught you all. <laughs> so benthic macroinvertebrates are essentially bugs that are found in the sediment. And because they're found in the sediment, they have a lifespan. And because they're living, instead of giving us a snapshot of the water chemistry that they're finding, that you would find just by taking a water sample at just one moment in time, you're actually getting a thorough assessment of the water quality based on the lifespan of a living organism. So by looking at the water quality from a chemistry standpoint and the biology, you're able to get a thorough assessment of the water quality. And you're able to actually then definitively evaluate what kind of water chemistry and what quality there is at, at that particular location. And we use that kind of information in what are called watershed report cards, which, very lucky, in a couple of weeks is World Water Day, and every conservation authority in the province will be releasing a watershed report card. And that watershed report card will report on their watershed quality, and based on forest conditions, their water quality, and their wetland cover. So I'd ask you to pay attention to your social media, because um, that will, you will be able to see uh, us announce, um, both ourselves as Grace Sobel, um, those of you who are live closer to Nottawasaga, Nottawasaga, every conservation authority will be, will be releasing their watershed report card on March 23rd. So I mentioned the chemistry and the biology and the importance of, of, of those two particular uh, disciplines, but we also have hydrology, which I am going to speak to, but hydrology is essentially the water levels. And we have all three components, which allow us to evaluate the baseline trends in water quality. So we're able to determine what kind of water quality is there in that water, how has it changed over time, which is the trends, and then we can decide the effectiveness of our watershed programming. And that's where we can determine where we need to, to focus some of our efforts on, for example, stewardship programming, which I'll speak to later, and where we need to focus that stewardship programming in terms of putting riparian buffers in place to capture sediments that might be coming into the water and bringing with them chemicals that we might be running off from a, a, a farmer's field or from some sort of, of road that might be carrying chloride from road salt being applied on the road. The next thing I wanted to speak to is our flood and erosion control infrastructure. So we have 30 structures in the Saugeen watershed. And these structures include dams and dikes and they also include um, channels. And these structures essentially control the flow of water, they restrict the flow of water, and they also protect slopes from erosion. So the essence of our flood and erosion control program is two parts. First, we have our non-structural approaches which is keeping people away from water, 
And then we have structural approaches where our goal is keeping water away from people. <laughs> Two prongs. If one doesn't work, hopefully the second will work. So our non-structural approaches is essentially regulating development in the floodplain, which I will be speaking more about later. Um, we also have our flood forecasting and warning program. I will also speak about that a little later. <coughs> Uh, our water infrastructure and maintenance and, and inspection program, and of course our emergency planning where we work with our municipalities to ensure that in the event of a flood, we are working collaboratively with our municipalities to make sure that you as residents find out soon enough to make sure that an action takes place to remove you from an unsafe environment. And then of course we have the structural approaches which are the dams, dikes, and channel works which, of course, you will see throughout our watershed dams, which are, of course, large concrete structures. Dikes tend to be um, large mounds on either side of a, a water course, and channel works tend to be something that constrains water in one location, so that it essentially can't go one way or another. Maybe I'll pause just now. Any questions? Yes. <clears throat> like you're, you're worried about the water levels. I live on Georgian Bay. I live right off the lake. And the lake is down more than eight feet this year. Mm -hmm. We haven't had the snow we've always had. So I'm wondering how your calculations are. Mm -hmm. Uh, how you're figuring them out because we haven't had the snow like we should have you know and everything's going to be drier you know so i'm just wondering how you came up with that you know because of the lack of snow like when when i see my lake in front of my house down eight feet like where is that water going and what about everything else well, water levels are, are on the Great Lakes are also regulated artificially, so I think that's important to keep in mind. So when the water levels are, are being regulated artificially, there are some more water in certain locations and then in others. And we do have to keep in mind that, that as far as the water levels in the Great Lakes are, are concerned, we are seeing a lot of fluctuation in these recent years. Yes, sir. The Big Head River, is that part of your conservation authority? Which? The Big Head River? No. Which conservation I believe that is uh, Grace Hobbles. Yes. Grace Hobbles? Yes. Okay, I'm going to keep going. I'll answer your questions afterwards. Okay. okay. Um, in terms of flood forecasting and warning, this is probably one of the most important things that we do. Uh, because it's part of the emergency planning network that I spoke about earlier. Our flood forecasting and warning system is essentially our early warning system to advise us if there are higher water levels at a certain location in our watershed. So we have a variety of flood uh, stream gauges that are located throughout our watershed, um, approximately 20. And those stream gauges measure um, how much water is flowing past those stream gauges. They are also affiliated with rain, um, rain gauges, which have tipping buckets. So they can measure the amount of rain that has fallen in, a re in recent areas and at recent times. We also have meteorological stations, which measure the wind speed as well as air temperature and is recorded either manually or automatically from our stations. And we are also um, got a number of uh, snow surveys that we do in the winter specifically. And with respect to um, our snow surveys, they're conducted from November to May, and they measure essentially how much s snow water or water is compacted in the actual snow itself. Next, we have the Drinking Water Source Protection Program. And when we're talking about the Source Protection Program, 
I want I want to just ask how many of you have heard of the Clean Water Act? That's wonderful. So the Clean Water Act itself has been um, something that is very near and dear to my heart. Um, I, I've worked on it for, since its inception. And when it comes to the actual program itself, um, we're part of the Saugeen Gray Sobble, the Northern Bruce Peninsula Source Protection Region. And when Justice O'Connor developed the source, or uh, made his recommendations through his, his uh, inquiry, he recommended that the best way in which municipal sources of drinking water and drinking water itself was to do so on a watershed scale. And the best way to do that on a watershed scale, he said, is, hey, we already have the network that developed in the conservation authorities. And so in developing those, that network, he actually had a number of recommendations with respect to how we could protect drinking water. Source protection would be the first phase of that network. So protecting the actual sources of drinking water so the, the actual groundwater itself, the actual surface water itself. And that's why we have uh, such extensive monitoring networks. But we do have additional water treatment, inspection, testing, distribution, and the actual drinking water itself. When you get that at your, at, out of your tap, it's gone through these, these steps. But you can know that before it actually gets to <coughs> the water treatment system, your water has gone through a rigorous um, rigorous program called the Clean Water Act, where a drinking water source protection plan has ensured that there have been no significant drinking water threats that have been placed around your municipal well or your drinking water system, or those that were existing have been managed in such a way that they cease to be significant anymore. So just to give you an idea, there are 29 systems that draw from groundwater in our, in our source, or source protection region, eight that draw surface water, and there's a one combined system in Hanover that is both surface water and groundwater. Next, I wanted to touch on environmental planning and regulations. Many of you have heard of, I'm sure, a, a, a conservation authority permit. This is where we get our name authority. <laughs> and of course, it's not always easy being the bad guy, but of course, our job is to make sure that there is no building in the floodplain, or there is no kind of construction or alteration to a wetland or a watercourse that is going to cause disruption to the flooding and any kind of erosion hazard that is going to impact, be impacted by that particular building. So we do have, every conservation authority has an environmental planning and regulations department. We do have a particular regulation at Slocking Valley. It's called Regulation 169.09, or 06, pardon me. However, with the recent Bill 23 changes, there will be um, likely some changes to that regulation, and there will probably be one regulation for the entire province, for each conservation authority, as opposed to individual <coughs> regulations. That particular regulation allows us to issue permits for development. So often when you are building something, this is when you need a building permit, probably from your, your building official, but you also need to check with your conservation authority because you might be building something that is near the floodplain, near a watercourse, or near um, some sort of, of um, uh, um, depression that might trigger a conservation authority permit, and it's always best to check. Now, with respect to the Planning Act, conservation authorities also have the responsibility for delegated responsibility under the Planning Act. So that means that anything with respect to natural hazards, so that is flooding and erosion, 
the Conservation Authority is the, re the responsible party to provide comments to the municipality. And the municipality then it looks at the comments that are provided and makes a decision. In this respect, the Conservation Authority does not make the decision. We merely provide comments on, for example, um, a, a subdivision or a minor variance or um, a severance, but we, we, our responsibility is to do that because it's delegated under the provincial policy statement. Next, I wanted to touch on our land conservation. Um, land conservation is one of the things that conservation authorities do, um, and quite frankly, we are very proud of. We have conservation authorities that are available to the public. We also have lands that we protect. And when we protect these lands, it's for the premise that they are they are important lands. We want to protect them because of their natural heritage. So that means the biology of the lands, the ecology of the land, as well as the, those lands are um, protect a particular drinking water source or a surface water source. All of those particular natural features go into our decision in terms of whether to acquire a piece of land. In Saugeen Valley Conservation Authority's uh, situation, we have quite a few forested properties. In fact, we uh, have a number of uh, forestry services that we provide to um, a number of, of the public, as well as we do on our own properties themselves. Um, with respect to our pri the, the services we offer to private landowners, and it's very common for other conservation authorities to tree plant. We also offer tree, um, tree marking, and we offer what are called managed, ta managed forest tax incentive plans, which is to develop these private um, forest, uh, forested plans that will protect a forested property for the future. Uh, we also own 8,000 hectares that are managed by SVCA, and that is considered managed forests. We acquired those, those managed forests from the Ministry of Natural Resources, and we're quite proud to own those, those forests. We also manage 153 properties in 86 groupings, so that means that we own several different properties together. And in, with that in mind, we, uh, did, we do own a number of wetland complexes. In total, we own uh, 81,000 hectares, almost 82,000 82, or and acres, not hectares, and almost all of which are available to the public. In addition, we have a number of conservation areas that are open and available to the public. Hopefully you've been able to experience some of those conservation areas. Allen Park, um, Denny's Dam, McBeath, Stony Island are all very popular to visit. We do have three different campgrounds, Brucedale, uh, Sogging Bluffs, and, and Durham, where we actually have camping available. And that is unusual for a conservation authority. There are only probably a handful of conservation authorities in the province that have camping available to, to, um, to the public. Most of the conservation authority or conservation areas are day use areas. Next, I wanted to touch on watershed stewardship. And this is where we care for the land. And this is particularly where there is considerable um, advantage to conservation authorities because we work with the local people to actually enhance the environment. Watershed stewardship is essentially caring for the land. And we have a number of programs that are taking place at conservation authorities across Ontario where we're looking at tree planting, riparian planting, um, septic system uh, improvement programs. A number of conservation authorities have what are called rural clean water programs, where those programs are actually designed to help the agricultural community 
with um, improvements to their, their, their agricultural properties. And with that in mind, there, um, there are monies available to those landowners with the um, proviso that they can improve their manure, manure storages, their milk house wastewaters, um, put in fencing to protect uh, against um, cattle going into the creek. Um, there are also programs to improve septic systems and water well improvement programs as well. At Saugeen, we have uh, we've planted approximately 5.8 million trees since the uh, 1970s, and uh, we are averaging about 150,000 trees on it per year, and we're still maintaining that average. And we have a water well improvement program that last year um, exceeded its subscription, so we were able to spend all of the money that we had available through the program to um, contribute to the improvement of water wells across the watershed. And we also have, uh, are actively involved in removing dams that um, have been identified as surplus. And lastly, we try to be actively involved in community groups that are, are interested in protecting um, the environment. And several conservation authorities have those, those affiliations, friends of groups, which have the ability to really enhance the local environment and really, because of that, that local passion, have been able to um, really make a difference in the environment. I just want to mention that we take joy in sharing our conservation lands with the public, something that we don't take lightly. Um, all of our conservation areas are open to the public with the with the understanding that we really want to make a difference. And with the many changes that have happened through the Conservation Authorities Act over the last several years, which have impacted the Conservation Authority, um, even with the decreased funding from the province, um, the municipalities have stepped forward to provide um, additional funding to keep our conservation authorities going, but we rely heavily on donations and we re rely heavily on grant opportunities to enhance our conservation areas. So what is next for us? Um, as I mentioned, uh, there are perennial changes to the Conservation Authorities Act. We're going through some major changes right now and those perennial changes will continue to keep us on our feet. Uh, we continue to only get approximately 1% of our budget from the province of Ontario, and um, the majority of our budget does come from our 15 municipalities that are participating municipalities, and those participating municipalities form our board of directors. And we are hoping that um, through opportunities like this, we uh, can get more people involved with understanding the importance of conservation authorities and perhaps having an understanding of what it's like to volunteer with the conservation authority and make a difference in the community. And with that, I thank you very much for the time that you've given me today. Mm -hmm.